you doing? This is Mike for Working Class Thought. So today's episode is going to be on H.H. H. Holmes. Now, Holmes was actually born Hermit Mudgett in Giltmet, New Hampshire, May 16th, 1861. Now, his parents' name was Levi Horton Mudgett and, the- and Theodette Page Price was his mother's name. Now, his older sister's name was Eileen. And his older brother name was Henry. Now, his family was mainly farmers. However, his father also worked as a painter and a trader here and there. Now, I want you to keep in mind that his parents were well-known, devout Methodists. Now, normally killers, they show signs at a young age. But in Holmes' case, there was no evidence of any kind of physical or sexual abuse towards him or him performing that on anybody else, or him torturing any kind of animals or killing anything whatsoever. In fact, Holmes managed to graduate high school at the young age of 16. Now, he uh, took a teaching job in Gilmanton later, and then later in a nearby nearby town named Alton. Now, July... 4th, 1878 was a huge deal for Holmes because that's when he married Clara. Now, hold on one second. Uh, yep, Clara Lovering in Alton. Now, he had a son named Robert Lovering Mudgett who was born February 3rd, 1880. In Ludden, New Hampshire, uh, New Hampshire. So here's an interesting fact about H. H. Holmes' son Robert. He actually became a certified public accounting, and he even served as the city manager for Orlando, Florida. So let's get back to H. H. Holmes. Um. Holmes actually enrolled in the University of Vermont at Burlington, Vermont at the age of 18. Eventually, he decided that he did not like the school. It just wasn't for him. So in 1882, he decided to go to the University of Michigan, and he went there in the Department of Medicine and Surgery. Now, he graduated in only two years, June of 19, uh, or 1884. Um, actually, while he was going to school, he actually worked underneath Professor Hardman in the anatomy lab. Now, Holmes later apprenticed in New Hampshire underneath Dr. Nahem Wright, a noted advocate for human dissection. In fact, years later, when Holmes was arrested for murder, he claimed to be nothing more than a graduate and admitted to using cadavers to defraud life insurance companies several times while he was in college. Now, Holmes' housemates, however, said that he was acted extremely violent towards Clara. Actually, it was in 1884, right before Holmes was supposed to graduate, she had enough, and she bounced back to New Hampshire, where she was from, and she later wrote that she knew little of him after that. Now, once H.H. H. Holmes moved to Moore's Forks, New York, a rumor started that he was hanging around a little boy. And then that little boy eventually vanished. Now, Holmes actually said that the boy moved back to Massachusetts and no investigation actually had never ever happened. And Holmes decided it's time to get out of town. He later moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And he got a job as a keeper in a uh, uh, Morrison Hospital. He quit, however, only after three days. And he would later take a job at a drugstore in uh, Philadelphia, or Philly, sorry. While he was working there, a young boy died, however, after taking meds he got from the store. And H.H. H. Holmes denied any involvement whatsoever in it. And he left town to, you know, because he decided, I got to get out of here. There, 
they're looking at me, man. So he bounced out. And so get this. Before Holmes actually moved to Chicago, he changed his name to Henry Howard Holmes to avoid the possibility of getting caught. Now, this is mainly he was afraid of getting caught for his scams that he was running. Now, in his confession, after his arrest, he claimed that he killed his classmate, Dr. Robert Leacock, in 1886 for the insurance money. But the real Dr. Lancock, however, died in Canada on October 5th, 1889. While he was married to Clara... Uh, he married Murda Belkins, October 1862, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Now, he actually filed for divorce from Clara, but the paperwork indicated that she was not properly notified. However, the divorce became complete, saying that she had committed infidelity. Now, however, get this. The case is ultimately dismissed June 4th in 1891 underneath the grounds that H.H. H. Holmes was wanted for prosecution. So, Holmes had a daughter with Murda, Lucy, whose name was Lucy Theodette Holmes, and she eventually became a school teacher. Now, Holmes actually spent most of his time in Chicago tending to his business. Holmes later married Georgina Yoke on January 17, 1894 in Denver, Colorado, while he was still married to Clara and Murda. So you notice a trend already, right, going on. At least that's how I felt. So, while he was still married to Clara and Murda, so if you know anything about H.H. H. Holmes, right, then you know about the murder castle. Like, seriously, anybody that knows anything about H.H. H. Holmes knows about his dream home, his murder castle. So let's start looking into that a little bit. So back when Holmes originally arrived in Chicago, August of 1886, while using the name H.H. H. Holmes, he came across the uh, drugstore on the southwest corner on South Wallace and West 63rd Street in Inglewood. The owner of the drugstore um, actually gave H.H. H. Holmes a job. And Holmes proved to be, you know, a fairly good worker, it was said. In fact, they let him run the store for a while and whenever they left. So, Holmes eventually bought the store from him. And the rumor that he killed him to get the building actually is false. The truth is, he purchased an empty lot across the drugstore on the 1st. It was actually a two-story building and it refused to pay the workers and they actually sued him in 1888. And briefly, let me touch bases on this. So what happened was he would have them employed. They would work for like one, maybe four days. And he'd like, get the hell out of here. And he would fire them saying that the work was incomplete. And that's the reason why they weren't getting paid. But anyways, let's move on. So in 1892, he added a third floor telling um, the investors it was to be a hotel for the Columbian World's Exposition, though it was actually never completed. The furniture suppliers actually uh, found Holmes was hiding the materials for which he actually never paid for and never intended to pay for. And he hid them in uh, hidden rooms and passageways that he had built. Holmes actually put soundproof rooms and mazes of hallways, some of which actually go nowhere. And many of the rooms he put oversized chutes in that would actually drop to the basement where Holmes put a bath of acid in. Now, and quicklime, depending. Now, real quick, I want to I, I, I wanna say the they had to be oversized because they had to fit people in them. And that was just something that was brought up. Also, the fact that he had a crematorium to dispose of his victim's bill. Once H.H. H. Holmes was arrested, however, his dream castle was lit on fire and was gutted completely. This is a unique case, however, because it was rebuilt and used as a post office until 1938. It was in 1892, however, it was almost complete. Three stories and a basement. The first floor was a storefront and the second story consisted of torture rooms with chutes to the basement. 
The third floor was an elaborate apartment. In 1894, some police actually entered the building while H.H. H. Holmes was gone, and they found rooms with hinged walls, false apparitions, secret passageways, airtight rooms with pipes that evidently was filled with gas, which he actually used as a gas chamber. So the room was airtight, so they couldn't get out. And then he would pump that gas in there. But he also had peeping holes in him so that he could watch him suffer. So, and then in the basement, he would dissect them, selling their organs and bones to medical institutions. So, we know a little bit about the castle now. So let's look into his actual murders. One of the first victims was Mistress Julia Smythe. Now, she was actually married to Ned Connors. Now, they moved into his building and began working at the pharmacy jewelry counter. So eventually, Ned Front found out about the affair and he decided to, be, uh, to get out of there. However, he left his wife and his daughter behind Christmas Eve. And while leaving them behind, it was Christmas Eve, 1891, that they both, however, disappeared. Though Holmes started, stated that she died during a botched abortion that she wanted that he was performing. Never the, nevertheless, nothing has ever been found or been confirmed. So now Emmeline Sagrain, she moves in and she begins working for him. Now Emmeline Sagrain also disappears. It was May 1892, although she disappeared December 1892. Etta von Tasso is also believed to be one of Holmes's victims there. When Holmes was working in the Chemical Bank building on Dearborn Street, he met and became very close friends with a gentleman named Benjamin Pitzel. Now, he was a carpenter with a criminal past. Now, Holmes used him as a right-hand man on several of his schemes, but a district attorney described Pitzel as no more than Holmes' little puppet on the string and basically a human pet. So early 1893, one-time actress Minnie Williams moved to Chicago. Holmes claimed to have met her at an employment agency, although Minnie said that he had met her in Boston years earlier. So at any rate, Holmes has, um, had um, hired her as a notary, and then over time, he signed the deeds over to Pistol of the building. Now, Holmes and Williams afterwards started claiming to be husband and wife. In fact, they rented an apartment in Chicago neighborhood of Lincoln Park. Interesting name. So, Mimi's sister actually came to visit in July. And she wrote a letter to her aunt claiming that she wanted to accompany her brother Harry to Europe. However, near, neither Minnie or Annie were ever seen alive again after July 5th of 1893. Holmes was a true entrepreneur in the sense that he used his former medical training. He turned murder into profit. With his connections, he sold his victim skeletons and organs to medical institutions all across the United States, but primarily his hunting grounds where he was living at. He would hire an assistant, however, who they were accused of stripping the flesh off the bones, dis, uh, dissecting them, and preparing the skeletons for sale. Now, the rest of the bodies were simply tossed in the pit of lime or acid, uh, to effectively breaking down the remains. And I also want to state that, so eventually, the insurance company started pressing H.H. H. Holmes, and they wanted to prosecute him for arson. Now, he left Chicago July of 1894, and he actually went back to Fort Worth, where he inherited property from the Williams sisters on Commerce Street and 2nd Street. It was there that he wanted to build another castle like his that he had in Chicago. But, however, once again, he had hustled the suppliers. Only this time, July of 1894... Holmes was arrested for and charged with selling uh, mortgage goods in St. Louis, Missouri. Now, he was bailed out. While he was locked up, he started talking uh, to a convicted outlaw named Marion Hedgepeth, 
who was serving a 25-year stretch. Now, Holmes convinced him to swindle an insurance company with him out of $10,000 by taking a policy out on himself and then faking his death. Now, Holmes promised Hedgepath a $500 commission in exchange for a lawyer that Holmes could trust. Now, he was directed to a young attorney in St. Louis named Jepitin Howe. Now, Howe worked for his brother Alfonso Howe, but he had nothing to do with Holmes' little hustle. However, Jepitha Howe found his ideas purely brilliant. Nevertheless, Holmes planned to fake his death, but it failed with the insurance company because suspicions, uh, suspicions, and um, they re they grew suspicious and refused to pay. Sorry, but I. Holmes did not fight it, however, in this case. Instead, he thought of another hustle, and Pitzel agreed to fake his death so that his wife could collect ten thousand uh, dollars life insurance policy, which she would split with Holmes and Jephthah Holmes. So, the scheme was to happen in Philadelphia, and this would have been split three ways, by the way. It called for Pitzer to set himself as an investor um, underneath the name S.F. Perry and then be killed and disfigured in the lab explosion. Holmes was to find an appropriate cadaver to play the role as Fitzer. Instead, Holmes decided to kill Pitzel by knocking him out with chloroform and then he lit his body on fire and used benzene. When Holmes was confessing, he said he was still alive after the chloroform prior to the fire. However, at trial, it showed that it was administered after his death. A fact the insurance company did not know, presumably, to fake uh, suicide to exonerate Holmes, should be he charged with murder. Holmes actually collected the insurance payout on the basis of a genuine corpse being provided. Holmes then went farther and manipulated his wife into allowing three of her five children, Alice, well, uh, Nellie, and Howard, to be in his full custody. Her eldest daughter and the baby remained with Miss Petzl, however. Holmes and the children traveled through the USA and Canada. Simultaneously, he would escort Miss Petzl allowing Perial Count, um, all while using aliases and lying to Miss Petzer concerning her husband's death, claiming to her that he was alive and very well in London, also lying to her about her children's whereabouts. So in Detroit, just prior to entering Canada, uh, they were only really separated by a couple blocks, it said, and even more crazier, uh, that Holmes was staying in a completely different location with his actual wife. Now, she was actually unaware of everything, however. Holmes later confessed to killing Alice and Nellie by forcing them into a large trunk, and then he put a hose through, the, um, through a hole, which he had attached to a gas line, to suffocate the girls. He buried their new bodies in a cellar of his rental house that he had on 16th Street and Vincent Street in Toronto. The home no longer exists, however. Frank Geyer, a Philadelphia detective assigned to investigate homes, found the missing children, and he found the decomposed of two of Petzl's girls in the cellar of the Toronto house. Now, Detective Geyer wrote that the deeper that they dug, the more horrible the odor became, and then they reached three feet and discovered the bone of a forearm sticking out of the ground, and it was of a human. So Geyer then went to Indianapolis, where Holmes rented a cottage. It was there that, they said, Holmes purchased the drugs that he had used to kill Howard Petzl, as well as... He got a repair shop. Uh, Holmes also managed to get a repair shop, shop that he actually uh, used to sharpen his knives. 
that he would use to chop up the body before he burned it. The boy's teeth and uh, bits of bones were actually discovered in the house's chimney. So eventually, H.H. H. Holmes was captured in Boston November, uh, November 11th, 1894. He was tracked down by the Pinkersons Detective Agency. He had an outstanding warrant out of Texas, and get this, for horse theft. <laughs> Once they discovered Alice and Nellie's body, July of 1895 in Chicago, uh, Chicago police began investigating his murder castle. Although no evidence was actually discovered, according to historians, the rumored uh, torture equipment that was there actually never existed. Although many people say it was, and the city just simply covered it up. So October of 1895, H.H. H. Holmes was put on trial for the murder of Benjamin Petzl. And he was found guilty and sentenced to death. By then, it was common knowledge he had also killed the Pitzel children. So following his conviction, he confessed to 27 total murders. But he said that he killed in Chicago, Indianapolis, Toronto. But one fact you need to know about H.H. H. Holmes is some of his victims that he claimed that he killed were found to be still alive. It is also known that he also did six attempted murders. So, it is also crucial for people to understand that H.H. H. Holmes was also paid $7,500 by um, Harris newspaper in exchange for his confession to the murders, which investigators quickly found was almost all nonsense. Holmes actually gave various contradictory accounts of his life. He also claimed that he was innocent, stating that he was possessed by the devil. The fact that he had a talent for lying made it very difficult for investigators to find out what the truth was based on his confession. This case gets more interesting, trust me guys. So, while he wrote his confession out in prison, he mentioned how drastically his facial expression had changed since his imprisonment. He described how he had a grim appearance, trying to take a more take on satanic appearance, I guess. He stated he was uh, convinced, after all the killing that he had done, that he was beginning to look like the devil. So, on May 7th, 1896, um, the time as Philadelphia County Prison for the murder of Pitzel. Holmes was known to actually stay calm and amiable. He showed very few signs of fear or anxiety nor depression, almost in full comfort, it was said. Despite the fact that Despite all of these facts, he asked for his casket to be covered in cement. Also, he wanted to be buried exactly 10 feet in the ground. And the, his reason for this was because he was concerned about gra uh, grave, uh, grave robbers. Would steal his uh, body and use it for dissection. So get this, Holmes did not snap. Whenever he was being hanged, whenever he was being executed, they, they hung him. But his neck didn't snap. Instead, he just kind of dangled there and slowly twitched for about 15 minutes. And it was said that it was done before being announced dead 20 minutes after dropping. So, New Year's Eve, 1909, Hedge was pardoned for informing on Holmes who was killed by police officers, though. Um, Hedge was actually pardoned for reforming on Holmes. However, he was also killed by police officer Edwin Jer uh, Jarberic during a held-up at Chicago Salon. So, March 7, 1914, uh, the Chicago Tribune reported that unexplained the fact that Quinnian died by suicide taking... Uh, Strykine. Um, his body was found in the master bedroom of the murder castle with a note that read, I could simply not sleep anymore. And his family claimed that he had been haunted for several months 
and that he has simply uh, suffered hallucinations. So the castle had a strange fire, August of 1895. Uh, two men were seen entering the back of the castle between 8 and 9 p.m. About half an hour later, they were seen running away and several explosions were heard and went up in flames. So after the investigation, they found a half-empty glass scene or glass or gas can, sorry, underneath the back steps. And it survived and was used. Uh, the building survived, though, and it was used as a post office until 1938, and then it was completely demolished. The city didn't want it there anymore. <clears throat> so when you get into H.H. H. Holmes, real quick, I want to touch bases on something. Recently, there was a TV documentary called American Ripper, and um, they attempted to... Um, show proof that H.H. Uh, H. Holmes was in fact Jack the Ripper as well. And they did this with the help of, hold on one second, Jeff Mudgett, who was a descendant of H.H. H. Holmes and an ex-CIA operative named Amaris Fox. Now, it is actually said that, like I said earlier in the podcast, way earlier, that H.H. H. Holmes was actually registered on a ship manifest um, that was coming back from London, England uh, to the United States. I do want to point out something that for a brief time period, around a time period that it is said that H.H. H. Holmes was actually in London, um, the insurance fraud stuff abruptly start, uh, stopped. Like everything has stopped in the United States that involved Holmes. And then, whenever he was on his way back to the United States, it is said that from that time period on, that is when the uh, Whitechapel and Jack the Ripper murders actually quit happening. Now, I also want to point out some other facts, that a lot of people are quick to dismiss this fact, that they could be one and the same, uh, based uh, purely on the premises that the, um, the murder scene for Jack the Ripper was actually more brutal. In fact, it couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, Jack the Ripper would actually take his victims, um, if it was in a street corner, he would take his victims and he would suffocate them, effectively quiet, make them quiet, so that nobody could actually hear them that was different, uh, with an earshot. And then, after that, he would gently place them on the ground, making sure not to make any noise whatsoever. And then, he would cut them. But each victim... It wasn't so much as a mutilation as the fact that I think it was a shock for the local people in during that time period because he took it, their organs. All the victims had missing organs. That was another factor. In fact, Jack the Ripper's last victim was horrific. And it said that it was she was dismembered to the point to where nobody could even recognize uh, the victim anymore. She was completely unrecognizable because she was just the flesh was completely gone. Um, the eyeballs were taken out, like all of the arteries were taken out of the body. Often, often he would take, the Ripper would take organs and they were carefully done, hinting medical training, just, just the same, just the same as what H.H. Uh, H. Jones found. Now they both had surgical training and both of them were known to take their victims' organs and their body parts and sell them. So I ask you, Who's to say that when the victimology is so close and so so close together, the time frame stating can even the time frame stating can even place homes in London and at the same time. Even the sketch artists, even the sketch artists, so they went back and they looked at the initial police uh, reports, and I guess some sketch artists did a sketch and it resembled strongly looked like H. H. Holmes. And they went one step farther. So Jack the Ripper, he he taunted the police, similar to what the Zodiac Killer did. I mean, just straight up just fucked with them, man. Hold on one second. He would taunt him. Completely taunt him. And just constantly go at him. Just constantly go at him and go at him. But the handwriting analysis that they used uh, was found, I want to say it was either 80 or 90 something percent accurate to be one and the same person writing. 
So we have all of these, the people here in the true crime community. We have all of these factors right here. We have the handwriting analysis with the 80 to 90% probability of being one and the same person. That's what I know. I don't know for sure I'm going to post something in the video slide, so stay tuned for that to see that. Uh, that shows the exact uh, pointage of um, how it could be. And then you also have the shit manifesto that shows H.H. H. Holmes' um, name on it. You And you also have the sketch analyst that looks ironically almost exactly the same, they say. And then you also have the um, fact that H.H. H. Holmes managed to get to Chicago just so happened to be around that same time period, and he procured that property. Now, we already debuffed the fact that H.H. H. Holmes did not kill the elderly people. It was an elderly man and woman that he was actually um, working for back in Chicago. Briefly, when we were talking about that, that was an elderly couple, and they liked him so much that they just gave him a really good deal on the building and eventually he bought the building across the street that's pretty much the gist of that but both people had surgical like skills and all the victims had some type of body parts now granted the ones on the street wasn't necessarily um the ones on the street wasn't necessarily all of the organs weren't taken out if i'm gonna do an episode specifically on jack the ripper i think but i if memory serves me right, I want to say it was like at least one, if not like two organs were taken out of all the victims. And the last one, they were all taken out and completing the eyeballs. Like she was just gutted, man. So you got to put this into factor. So we can't honestly say, I can't sit here and look at you guys and honestly say I am 100% positive that they are the same person. I can't say that uh, beyond, you know, anything else. I, I simply can't. However, I can say, looking at the analysis of the handwriting, looking at the sketch artist, looking at the shit manifesto, looking at all of that, I can honestly say that there's a strong probability, um, a very high strong probability, that H.H. H. Holmes and Jack the Ripper are actually one and the same person. Now, I I stress that you guys keep that in mind, those those couple factors when you go into this. And I also strongly suggest you guys watch the documentary called American Ripper that was done on the History Channel. That was an amazing job done um, when they were actually using the person that we were referring to before. Uh, which was the ex-CIA operative and the actual descendant of H.H. H. Holmes, where they went forth and did, I want to say it was like a four, six-part segment that was done on them. And that proved all of that together. So um, I'm sorry about this one being so short. I am going to attach a very great musical slideshow. I actually managed to find three songs by three different bands that were actually written specifically about H.H. H. Holmes. So I'm very excited to present that to you guys. And like normal, I'm going to try to present some extra bonuses attached to this uh, podcast as well. So, once again, this has been Mike for Working Class Thoughts, and this has been the first part on the series of my personal favorites list, H.H. H. Holmes slash Jack the Ripper Connection. Again, this is Mike for Working Class Thoughts. Everybody stay tuned because soon I'm going to be bringing you guys Elizabeth Bathory, a.k.a. the Blood Countess. Very excited about bringing that for you guys. Everybody, I hope you guys have a great day. Peace, love, and good vibes to all. Um, and with that, everybody have a great night.